All right, we are talking talk about we talk about veins, knocks, inserts. Now we talk about the shaft itself. This is the most difficult and most technically challenged subject. So anytime you don't understand, stop me, because this is the first time I present this. Okay. Let's talk about the history of arrow shaft. Arrow shaft start with what's the first arrow shaft usually made of? Bamboo. Hollow bamboo. Then you go into wood. Then we do split bamboo to get a to get the best. Then we move into aluminium, carbon aluminium composite, and then we go to carbon. What's the big deal and benefit of each? Bamboo is really one of the straightest, strongest, lightest material out there, no doubt about it. In the case of wood, you do a spine tester forever and you finally hopefully get about a dozen to a dozen and a half cedar arrow shooting the same. But you know they don't. Temperature change, moisture change, it's all over the place. Then, of course, then when you talk to people who really like bamboo, like the Japanese Jandao people, they will use split bamboo. Well, that's about as good as it gets. It's actually better than a lot of things out there. But damn, are they expensive. A good Jandao Master split bamboo, we're talking $1,400 to $1,500 a dozen. <laughs> well, think about it. Somebody is splitting the bamboo, oh, cutting yeah. the outer edge, shave the thing, put six pieces on together, and then wrap it, and then wipe it, and then glue it to get your arrow, and then spine off them to give you a dozen arrows that shoot the same. <laughs> That's a freaking month. That I mean, two weeks work. <laughs> so I'm not sure if you have, if I if you had to work two weeks to sell somebody something and support your family, fifteen hundred dollars is not a lot of money. You only seven hundred bucks a week. <laughs> and remember, you come up with your skill, your tools, your material. Now let's talk about the aluminium, carbon, and carbon aluminium, which a lot of talk about. To be frank with you. In the current stage of game, the best arrow are aluminum inside and carbon on the outside. There's no doubt about it. What's the benefit of that class of arrows? Why is that class of arrow so good? Well, you can build the core of the arrow with the aluminum process and straighten into the tolerance and everything, and then you just wrap it carbon over the top of it. Make it stiffer and lighter. Consistent spine. Consistent spine. The linear spine. The linear spine. That's the only thing that carbon aluminum out there that would do. It's a linear spine. So what's the problem? I mean, a lot of times people say, remember the Beeman days is extruded carbon. It's great stuff. The spine is reasonable linear. What's wrong with it? When it fell, it's catastrophic. And as time goes on, the spine changes. Now, what do people do? Before I go there, let's talk about what is the difference in current technology on carbon. Okay, what carbon tube we currently make most? We make golf clubs, fishing rods. Arrow is a very, very, very small area in the carbon manufacturing process. The structural carbon is the biggest. If you look at all the drones, all the major construction light, they're all carbon tubing constructions. They're parallel tubing constructions. What are they so special? What is the, why is a lot of fishing rod technology not in arrow? Why is our golf club technology not in arrow? What are the difference? And a lot of people do not know that. And I'm going to emphasize it today. All golf club fishing rods and 90% of the medium sized arrow are tapered. People say, no, 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 my arrow is straight. I say, are you sure? There's only three companies in the world that made arrow that is straight in the inside. Which is your gold tip, your black eagle, and also your uh, carbon, carbon, uh, Carbon, uh, Rick McKinney, that will be carbon tape. Every arrow is slightly tapered. Some of them more than others. Measure the front and back of every single carbon arrow. There's always one to two thousand difference. How come? Because they all thought that when they lower the temperature of the arrow, when they pull the mandrels, it's easier. So how do you build? Why is an arrow being parallel so critical? Because we want consistency. The moment when an arrow is tapered, what does that mean? It have a different behavior from every one of them. 
Now, you remember the nitro stinger arrow or the first ever taper arrow from Lemmy Glass? That's the reason nitro stinger's pattern don't mean anything because 10 years before that, Lemmy Glass already made taper arrows. And when you look at taper arrow, like, like the nitro stingers, they are fantastic arrows, except one small problem. Not two of them should the same. <laughs> the only company at this current stage of the world able to make a taper that's consistent is made by St. Croix. St. Croix spent over two and a half million dollars with 3M to come with that machine. And if you want a dozen arrow, prepare to pay 1200 bucks. <laughs> because you're getting 12 that, 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 uh, uh, that St. Croix 5 arrow tubes to make arrow shafts. Now, why is an arrow shaft being parallel so critical? because you want the arrow to flex consistently. Now, when we go into, especially on the technology like a golf club, or any, the only shaft that's similar is structural carbon. Structural carbon is always parallel, always perfectly straight. But guess what? It was not meant to bend. So what is such a big deal about carbon arrows? That's different from anything else. Carbon arrow is the only parallel shaft that's meant to bend. Now, when it bends on carbon arrows, just like construction process, which I'll bring you to the next slide. This is what happened, I mean, it's not very clear, but take a closer look. All the linear carbon, that is extruded linear carbon, that is what even makes their own arrow. All the carbon are unidirectional, all the front to back, all right? But then what happens if it breaks? It's catastrophic. Now, this is what goes to make the arrow. You start with a, you start with a directional carbon, semi-linear, you offset the angle from layer to layer. What does that mean? That means you offset the, the angle like this, and then go 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 like this. It's supposed to overlap and cancel out the angle effect. Right? The word is supposed. <laughs> but since they're being angled, the moment when you do multi-layers, there's where the helix and compact compound helix spine come in. Because no matter what, the layers in between will always have a weak and a soft spot. So the spinal resulting spine itself, this is actually more like this, or this, or this, and this. That's the reason when you've got a current arrow, if you spine index it, the moment you cut it, the, index, the spine of the arrow will change. The position of the spine is no longer linear. That means if you have a, so if any company tell you, they will pre-index the arrow before they ship it to you. The truth can only be if you don't cut the arrow at all. The moment you cut it, the resulting spine is always removed, left or right. And I prove to everybody, that's the reason I go, I play, all the major companies have all my machines. I actually build a spine detection machine in it. So I can tell you what spine the arrow is and which way it's supposed to be. Because what you're looking for is the resulting bend of a shaft. <clears throat> now, that being said, what can we do about it? This is what I come up with. It's, a, it's our flagship four-layer carbon system. The first, set, the first, third, and fourth are all true weave carbon at 90 degrees. What does that mean? That means those carbon fiber fours are always this and this. When you cross weave a carbon fiber, 100%, What's the downside of it? No spine strength, because none of the fibers are linear. That means if you build a carbon fiber arrow out of pure weave shaft, you will have an arrow that's three times as heavy with no spine. So how do we overcome it? Using a 4K modular carbon and go linear from front to back at zero degree. So now all of a sudden, the first, second, the first, third, and fourth layer is identical. If I want to make this thing 300, 350, 310, I just need to change the second layer. I get exactly what I needed, consistently. Because the first, third, and fourth layer have nothing to do with spine. But to maintain explosion and consistency. So all of a sudden, my resulting spine is linear. But in order to do this, something had to change. A normal arrow, with a five rep, five layer rep have 10 layers on it. My arrow had 25 to 30 layers. So what changed? Carbon fiber thickness. 
So I actually designed a carbon fiber that's one fifth the thickness of normal ones. <laughs> so when you move from one to the other layer, what happened to the layer to layer gap? The moment you increase the layer, become less important. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> and I got a proprietary process. See, most arrow will come out and you pull the mandrel. Then you grind it in the, in the water, water tub, centerless grind. After finish, you got 1,000, 3,000, 5,000. I actually designed my own machine. The worst I can get is 1,000. And not to mention, because of knowing the technology, I've decided not to make the chip error. I can make something like the Carbon Express at 1,000 thickness and make money at $49.95 a dozen. This arrow, is got, this specific arrow, is going to be $159.95 a dozen. But I'm going to give you similar technology, like people like OD Pro 100 and so on, with the, with the 5, 4K wrap that I come up with for $89.95 a dozen. So all my arrows are going to be 1,000 or better. If they are not, simply cut half an inch of it, you will be. It's only on the end. Because I can't disclose it because uh, I talked to my lawyer. All the process I have is so proprietary. The moment you heard it, you'll change the entire arrow industry. I have to design my own mandrel, my own machine, and my own fiber to, uh, to accomplish this. <laughs> so what's the benefit of this? This is a linear carbon arrow with, co with impact resistance with no torsion. Think about what I just told you. If you don't know me, you think I'm lying. <laughs> that means you can hit this arrow all day long. It will not crack. If it cracks, you will behave like tempered glass. It will come out with small chunks with a fresh cut end. Because it's stressed to the point it, break, it breaks, it breaks. Because these two wrap. See that? If this third layer wrap were to explode, the third layer wrap is controlled in 45 degree distribution. And the fourth layer is holding it at 0 and 90 degree distribution. How is it going to splinter? It couldn't. Now, this is what the part which gets real technical. See, as the arrow bends, the outside fiber is pushing this way and the inside fiber is pushing this way. Am I right? What is the shape of the arrow at this point? Is it this? Or is it this? Or is it this? Is it a circle, a elliptical, or an off egg? Answer is that you do not know. The construction dictates it. See, a lot of people, 90% of the time, this is what we expected. But it's not. I will prove to you later, every single arrow have two weakest points because when you flex it, the high point and the low point is not on the linear axis, it's off center. Now you know why when you flex it, when you shoot an arrow, it's an elliptical spin. Because the center of the arrow is not in the center, it's off center. That's the reason why they do it was doing this. It's an elliptical spin. That is why all the arrow is spiral spine. This also explains why the spiral spine is. Because as you move the arrow front and backward, this oblong shape keeps changing based on the spine area. So in other words, if you look at this circle as a shaft, okay, this is, this is the bending curve for 99.9% .9 of the carbon arrows. It is not what most people thought is this. You actually bend more like this. Which also, if you got my spine machine, you notice that the first spine you find the weakest spine is at 12 o'clock, you mark it. The second spine usually is at 7 o'clock or as bad as 4 o'clock. How come it's not at 6? Because none of them is at 6. The only one that possibly at 6 are aluminum arrows. Which explains a lot why arrows don't fly right. Now, understanding the construction of the arrow, understanding the first curve when you bend it, See, when you bend this arrow, which means that if this arrow have this, this side of the arrow is going to turn this way, and this side of the arrow is going to turn this way. That's your torsion. That's when people shoot arrows. Oh, my arrow naturally turn left. 
How come it's turning left? Because torsion. Because your knot did not force the arrow the backside not to move. What happened to the front? The entire arrow starts doing this. Because you compress it. On the, on the aluminum arrow, it will bend like this. It will bend like this. That's what carbon arrow's inherited problem is. So how do you overcome it? First of all, wrap me to the point that the torsion are no longer part of the equation. It is a very involved and difficult process. And that's the reason I told you aluminum arrow have an inherited benefit. Because the, anybody who knows fishing rod will tell you, the weakest point of the rod is the dictating factor of the entire rod. That means that I don't care how strong your handle is, your tip is how you, you spine your rods. If your rod do not follow your tip, you don't have a fishing rod. That means if you build a fishing rod, the spine is not linear and all the way through, you can't cast the little rod correctly and your fly line will go all over the place. <laughs> Same thing. But remember, that is based on a tapered shaft. And this is what? Linear. That means every single part exaggerates because there's no front and there's no back. The only thing we have front and back because we put a weight on it to give you the directional control. But that directional control was misunderstood so many times. People put a huge amount of weight in it. Imagine this, you put a huge amount of weight on it, what happened to the tail? It's free fall, isn't it? It's not flattening. Because remember, when, when you have so much momentum moving forward, the arrow, no matter with flex, what happened to the tail? It starts flapping like a dead fish. And that's the reason for people who use super heavy FOC arrow. What is the thing they always use? Feather. Why feather? Feather have no directional control. It will collapse. The moment you put directional control like veins on it, the whole thing just go down. That's the reason if you talk to Marcus out of German Kinetics or anybody who use 170 brand heavier on quote traditional bow, they will not use veins. They will always use feathers because feather gives you the least amount of drag and it will collapse if it go extreme. Just like if you got a feather at very extreme at an angle, the feather will collapse, have minimum effect. But if you got a solid vein, what happened? That vein will start directing the shaft. The arrow may go backwards. Think about it, it sounds ridiculous, but the resulting angle may equal to backwards. So you now to keep on increasing the weight of the point. Make sure you think, isn't it? <laughs> now imagine if you can control the arrow shaft totally. You control the spine totally. And the arrow will flex only very short wire. Just like with arrow vein, concentric points, and so on. What happens to the projectile? Your projectile will maintain the energy at a much longer distance. But why is this all suddenly become necessary? Because I actually got lucky enough to come from the crossbow world. Because as the speed of the arrow increases, as energy increases, we are moving to out of the normal quote unquote ram that we learn on the traditional arrow and feather. We are dealing with aerodynamics. We are dealing with harmonics. We are dealing with arrow launch cycles. It's just like all these years everybody's shooting a, a rumble. The moment you go with a rifle, it changes everything. Arrow vein, in my opinion, is equal to the rifling of an arrow change. And right now with the arrow vein, I have to clean up the rest of the act, which is my insert, my points, and everything I did, I finally come to the conclusion. I tried my best. I have to tackle the shaft itself. Now, knowing the shaft itself, I know that the arrow, the, the arrow weave is going to be superbly expensive. So during the process, I say, well, you know, what is the number one complaint of everybody? Is that if you got something like a decent arrow, you still have the outside splintering. So I'm going to give you spot weave, which is based on my technically the same as a Goldie Pro Hunter four layer, except I'm going to wrap my four pay carbon on the outside. And retail for $89.95. And it'd be one thousand of that. The whole thing is CNC basis on my design. <laughs> it's gonna be as fast or you are faster than the most. <laughs> so I think the industry is gonna come up with a pretty interesting impact on what I'm doing. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, now, understanding that shaft, you see that this force curve right here is one of the biggest deal because most people don't understand when you torque a shaft. See, when you hold a shaft and you twist it, you find out twisting left and twisting right is not the same. That itself should give you a hint how the arrow is supposed to turn. Turn as in circular turn. Mm -hmm. Because most people have an arrow like this. They never test the arrow like this. The moment you go home and test your arrow, you feel like some arrow turn easier this way and harder this way. So you know the arrow torsion is that side. So if you cut this side, the arrow main shaft will turn to here. Your, your shaft indexing is now counterclockwise. And most people do not understand, as arrow should get aged, the torsion is what you're facing. The torsion with the spine degradation is what the aging of a shaft means. The higher modular, the less aging you have, the less torsion it has. So with the arrow vein, uh, arrows that have a high torsion rate, is it because the arrow veins always spin it? Right. Right. It doesn't matter. It, so it's it's it, got it, enough to. You got enough to overcome. Yeah. Because see, an arrow, a, a normal arrow, based on the torsion, will not exceed half a turn. Oh. Maybe up to two turns in the first twenty yards. So you can the arrow vein two, even at low speed, mm -hmm. you're talking sixty turns in the first twenty yards. Sixty over two is is a non-issue. So okay, you're not spinning sixty. You're shooting fifty-eight. How bad does it feel? <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, in the crossbow, in the Oculus, we know that a 60 yard is doing 300 revolution every 20 yards with no loss of speed and no sound. That's the big deal. Yeah. Most people never believe it until they shoot mine. It's just like that's no sound. You can shoot in 30 miles per hour crossbow, the arrow just fly through. And for you guys who have shot it, you notice at any distance, and no matter what, the arrow will always hit the target perpendicularly because the arrow descended. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where the big deal is. It's the off-center spine center. And most people never understand this. That's the reason every arrow when you shoot, when you do a slow motion photography, the arrow actually flex, not centrally, but offset, like that. It's an elliptical spin. And I'm using the arrow veins, the inserts and so on, to, and the arrow concept to bring the arrow faster into that. So what happens if the arrow don't do that at all to start with? <laughs> That's where the arrow view come in. I, I think it's going to be changing quite a lot of thinkings out there. And the best part is that in, uh, when, when I was used at the first batch of arrow wing, arrow weave 350, I give to the gentleman in uh, Virginia to shoot the indoor 65, 85, whatever that is. Or the guy shooting the same target. Yeah. He win it and come back with all 12 arrows and seven broken knives. <laughs> you know, because you know those shoots, every arrow touch each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. That pretty much tell you what's going on. I was so thrilled. That didn't happen to me last year. <laughs> no. <laughs> Remember, he come back with all the arrows, none of them broke, but with seven broken knives only. And some veins cut off. I came back from writing today with, uh, <clears throat> last, this weekend, I went with uh, nine arrows, wasn't sure if I had enough. I, I came home with six. Very good, you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. All right, now let's talk about tools. Since you've got, you look at the shaft itself. So when's the, when's the anticipated release? Uh, the first, the arrow weave, the, the spot weave is going to be here next week. The arrow weave is going to be here in two weeks from now. On the 246, then the 300, then the 166, then the 315, then the 2764, then I'm beyond a condition, I'll have the 204 and then the 124. I'm not doing half ass. No. I'm doing the whole deal. But at the same time, just like I said, in order to carry fine art on the air on a squat weave, you can buy anything you want online, sure. but it being a dealer, you have to be certified and trained. It means I have to take this class, and you have a 50 mile protection radius. And I will sell to anybody on the arrow weave, but not the squat weave. That is, too I mean, not, that is too critical. I need the dealer to understand this before I sell it. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to just build it and tell me it's no good. Oh, it didn't work for me. <coughs> no, it, it, it worked for you, you just don't know how to put it. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason I had to, the dealer had to be certified and trained. Now then, just like this arrow, before all this, this is where the tool begins. 
I had this too in 2008 Matthew show, and most people don't understand it. That's my Erwin J. You see? Yeah. This, now most, and as I said, the Bissenberger will give you between set 5 to 17 degrees in accuracy. With the current Aerovane jig, I will guarantee 100, 128 to 256 of a degree per arrow. If you take a closer look, inside this piece is two 8 back 5 ceramic ball bearing on a saconium index. How off can you get? <laughs> and then, look at the entire part. Those are neodymium magnets. I no longer sell this. This is the last two pieces after that. The aerobic adjustable chuck are no longer sold. I am convinced most customers are just not good enough to use it. It is meant for refletching, not for building, re building arrows. It's only meant for refletching. Because you can see that the only way to get it right is just like tools. If you own a set of craftsmen, you own a craftsman on Snap-on, would you like to replace it with just a crescent wrench? And that's what the whole world tell you. You are better off with a hammer and a crescent wrench than a whole Snap-on two set when you build arrows. Answer is that you're out of your mind. That's the reason I built the entire chuck set. You notice that? This is for pin mount. I built this for one and only one reason, to handle the old maker rooms. I do not recommend people using this. This is your pin line, 166, 202, 235, 246, 285, 300, 315. Anything beyond that, you use my bushing. Or just pin bushing. Because there's too many arrows above the 315 sizes. They're all specific. And every one of them have pin knots. So you can use the pin knot with my pin bushing, you're able to control. Why do you need this kind of control? And by the way, that three O-ring absolutely do nothing, except if you want to offset it. A lot of people keep on telling me, well, why isn't the O-ring worn out? The answer to that is that the arrow ring jet is to hold the arrow using this portion of the space. That is a taper space there. Because every single arrow was made on the mandrel that is supposed to be straight within that area. So the moment the arrow touched the mandrel, the metal to internal carbon will grab, will maintain about 15 pound force on it. That is where you're able to control the shaft and the tool. Until the shaft and tool become one, you cannot possibly fudge your arrow right. That's the reason I make all these sizes. It's like telling you, you have a 10 millimeter socket, go and fix the car, that's all you got to. <laughs> you and I both know, if the freaking socket is 9, 10 is useless, it's 11, it won't work. <laughs> and but, you, but everybody telling you, it's okay to use a 300 size chuck for a 246 size L. Because that's what you're doing. Because everybody using a 2219, which is a 303, a 350s on an LD, but you're using that jig to fudge your 166 shaft. Does it even sound right? <laughs> and then you look at the front of the shaft, which is right here. You notice all arrow vent jig have two levels, theoretically? Why two levels? Why levels to start with? Every single person burger, the thing is like this, right? What glue are they using back then? Watch bond. Yes. What's the viscosity of flush bond? About 20,000. What do we use today? Cyanide acrylate. What's the drawmeter? We're talking 200 or 60, 600 drawmeter. 600 center point compared to 10,000 or 20,000 center point. The viscosity is literally thousands of times different. When you flex point, when you put on the glue, the thickness of that glue is how many? We're not talking counting how many molecules. We're counting literally in the millimeters. <laughs> but the moment you start to in the, in the 600 center point, you are dealing with six molecules thick of glue. <laughs> Now you know why. If you use this jig with my veins, you are putting 0.03 grain of glue per vein compared to 0.8 or 1.5. That's per vein. Now if you take a closer look at this, that means at that moment, I will quarter level this jig first. Right? So what if I use a pin knife?
The diameter is sharp and the hook are no longer level. Am I right? Because you don't know what the hook can be. So the only way to guarantee this sharp is perfectly level is put a secondary level on it and using the just put the raise or lower it until the entire sharp is level. Because you are dealing with a 600 center point glue, then you want to evenly spread the entire glue over the entire surface. Otherwise, the moment you do it, the glue will flow down. You've got more glue at the back of the vein compared to the front. I noticed that with mine. I mean, I've got the bits with the upgrade from Zenith in it, and I've got the clamp I got from you with the brass. And when I get into the X10s or the 1.66s, I have got to do some manipulation. You had to physically flip the jig forward and then to pull it down. Yeah, and then or, I got to. Oh, I got to do like some I do it to where I do as I'm laying the jig in, I actually lay it in and roll it forward. And yeah, but you're, you have not enough glue on top. The only way to do it is that you have to physically flip the Bessenberger jig horizontally, then go down. Otherwise, the glue will come down. That's not enough glue on the front, it's too much glue on the back. Well, that and just manipulating the angles to get it to Jeez. land right. It's like, oh my God, these are a pain in the butt. And See, with this, remember, over. all the arrow veins are based on airflow veins. So the feet is 100%, it's based on tangent. I don't care what size of the shaft, the tangent is the tangent is the tangent. Now, a lot of people don't understand this, which I'm going to show you this. See this clamp? It took me a long time to design on the material and design. This is made of solid 303 stainless. It's cast and then machined. Inside there, there's built in one 16 inch stainless steel bar. Now what this did do is that you will now actually use, remember go all the way to the time that we're talking about the arrow vein? Yep, so it doesn't squeeze the all over the front. See that right here? The left and right, see this part here? See this part right here? You actually go into the wind channel. You clamp both sides. And if you take a close look, I actually polish this to be half thousands, like a quarter thousand straightness. So when you clamp the vein on top, what are you pushing down? Are you pushing the vein down? What are you actually pushing down? The boot. The boot. Yes, you're actually pushing this point and this point of the vein. So actually, remember I told you arrow vein was coming at a three millimeter degree? The more you point it, you do this. So now the glue is in the center and spread. So if you do it correctly, after everything's said and done, there's a six molecule of glue on it. <laughs> Think about it. We're talking 0.03 grain of glue per vein. So how much are we talking about if you actually use this? This is what arrow vein glue looks like. This would do 60 to 80 dozen of arrows for 10 bucks. Most people never believe me until they use it. And the moment you put it on nine seconds, it puts 680 pounds on pull force. That means me and you can buy hang underneath it, it still holds. <laughs> now why is this so critical? Why do I go through all this thing to make this arrow vein jig? And why is this so important for the entire process of the arrow ring and the glue? Because this is your reloading press. This is the only thing that holds the vein correctly to the shaft and guaranteed to be correct. Until you got this point, you cannot guarantee concentrate because even, okay, you go through a process, you weight your veins. What happened to your glue? How much glue you put in each vein? You say, okay, I'm uh, very correct. Now you're half ring off. Half ring, half ring. Exactly. <laughs> so what happens you have porn, porn one grain and half grain? That's 500% difference. Now people say, we're getting anal here. Uh, have you talked to Ben Shooter? Which one of them is not anal? If you're not anal, you're just not anal enough. <laughs> and this is what I'm pushing for. Now, of course, that water level is a design I have. I actually designed my own ball bearings crowned. So the water level actually allows you to rock and give you the perfect form. And then, as you can see, this is where the case will look like. Now, I give you extra other equipment that you needed. 
there's a leg there's a full light cap on two five laser system so you can use it to realign your vein point first before you refresh so i will guarantee you 0 0.5 degree when you refresh so what you do is that you you put the laser on the previous vein you clean the first vein you make sure they are within on the same vein when you click the index you're within half a degree not one degree not two degree half if you are careful using a front part you can move it to a closer to a quarter degree on the same then you can rotate the laser 90 degree now front and back you can control it so your reflection become simple and then since all my sauna acrylate system is 100 percent that's only dissolvable so when you finish you come to back vein you fudge it then you use a cotton cloth cotton cotton swab put the cotton swab on your where the vein is you melt the glue away now you've got a perfect surface to work with there's no scraping because the more you scrape you're damaging the fiber so we chemically remove the sauna acrylate now you've got a clean surface to work with and use a laser to guide it back i know it's a lot of work but you're talking an arrow that you spend so much time building why not take more time rebuilding it and okay now that is on the jig itself now we are talking about before you put the jig on the shaft in building process you now do that thing about the APS this is the APS I come up with that's an option over option <coughs> on any arrow under 400 spine two blocks is all you need but anything over under 400 spine you need a third anything over 700 spine you need four blocks because the shaft is too soft at the same time, when you start doing free spinning, if you don't have a pine ridge, get one. But the pine ridge don't let you force it because the pine ridge is too soft. So I give you the super spinner. Those are eight back three bearings sitting on an aluminum reel with the, with the O-ring on the side. People say, can't you just use the APS to spin? I say it's all mechanical advantage. If you use a two tiny ball bearing, the ball ring a turn one and a half turn before the 2764 turn once. The moment I increase the size, this will turn once the shaft turn five times already. Pure mechanical advantage. And this is the six different things you can do. You square your arrow end first. Because when you cut, you know your arrow end is always off. Then for some of the junk inserts, after you glue the insert, now this is part to be truth to you. If anybody need to square the inserts, that means the insert is not going right. If a lot of people say, let's go and square the insert, which means that your insert is actually offset. Why would the insert not be straight to start with? But let, let, let's just say, let's just go, beyond, go there and say, okay, we will let you square the insert. <laughs> in what times are you going to square the insert? When the fuel point of broadhead bent and cause indentation of the insert. That's the only time you need to square it. The next thing you want to do, fudging and resquaring. What does that mean? That happens a lot in competition shooting. Somebody nicked the back of your shaft. If you still want to use it, the first thing you do is sand that portion off. Yes, you're taking one or two grains off. But if you don't do that, that's going to be the beginning of the cracking point. So you, you either want to save it or you just want to use new arrows. The next thing about broadhead tuning. Now, this is a part that a lot of people don't really do. 99% of broadhead, because we're not my, without my double O-ring system, the moment you put a broadhead, if you don't spin tune it, you might as well not shoot it. I mean, the bad offenders are quite a few other companies, which I shall uh, not name. You already know them. Their, their furrows are so thin, you put the furrow down in the whole point that you can move about 15,000 level right. If you don't tune it and you expect to shoot through, you must be magic. <laughs> and I know I'm not. And of course, the spin checker. A lot of time when you put an arrow off, you finish it, you should always put a spinner, at least give you a rough spin to keep nobody what's wrong. Because, you know, things always happen. And if anybody knows on the most important time, like competition final and the trophy animal showed up, Murphy's Laws is always 10 times more powerful. And finally, outsert installation concentric check, just like I talked about error outsert. Most people buy this for that exact reason. They love the outserts, but they don't can't find a way to concentrate it. Because when the outsert is not concentric, it's like one of the guys, one of my customers, he from the for Federal Republic of California. <laughs> he said that we use all the insert until I check it with your spinner. All my arrows, not even one of them is straight <laughs> after the insert. And he did it and he now understands a big difference. 
Instead of shooting 20 yards, it's comfortable with shooting 55 yards. So, in other words, the moment the customer will warn it is that all of a sudden, let me just be frank, with today's technology equipment, if you are not comfortable shooting 50 yards, you have problems. You are telling me for the last 25 years, with technology, everything moving, we can barely shoot 20 yards accurately? And we are paying how much more for an arrow and bow? That's not even sound right, isn't it? Okay, now, the fun part, PAP system, PAPS, Professional Arrow Preparation System. I will, I will conclude you guys if you in the field. This is a system that most least people understand it. It is called the first dynamic band locator. That means you put a shaft on it, within two seconds, you're able to find out which direction is shaft going to bend first. Why is that important? It's the first flex. The first flex. That is also why, I mean, it's like people tell you, I'm going to give you the best tire and the best balance rim so you can drive your car with the best comfort. Then I come along and say you can buy most of the tire, most of the rim, and then I will spin balance it after you put it together. What do you think is better? Because if you perfectly balance the tire, perfectly balance the rim, does the car drive perfectly? Answer is no. Mercedes-Benz Racing will tell you that that's not the case. Because any time when you go in a car that goes for 100, 135 miles per hour, you don't balance the tire, you don't balance the rim, you balance the tire on the car. Because you deal the shaft, you have drum brakes, you have nuts to balance. Same thing with the arrow. That's the reason when you balance the shaft, you, you spine locate the shaft, you spin balance it, when you finish it after, after say two or three shots, you retest the, the, the arrows. Because a lot of arrow will be in, be in memory. There's maybe micro layer separation issues. So if you don't know, do you want to find out when you shoot that final 10x and find out that shaft was not doing well? Because you want to find out before it happens. That's another thing since I'm here, I will give you another tip. You notice how Chris, a fine knot click on the string? When you click on the string, you heard that specific tone. Cling, something like that. I will tell you, this is what you do. When you put the fine knot on the specific arrow on the specific bow, when the first time you do that, close your eyes and remember that tone. The moment you put the fine knot, we'll put, put an arrow onto the string, and at that day, the tone is not the same, you put the arrow down, pick another one. Because somewhere along the line, that's something changed on that shaft. That's the reason I patterned that knot is so critical. Because that knot will give you a complete tone check on your arrow. Nobody ever think of that. Because when you tone check an arrow, what part of the arrow is not checked? Okay, that's exactly my point. None. But you can't tone check an arrow if you've got a warm-up bag in it. Because the warm-up bag will give you different results. I do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then I get a soft click and I go, uh -uh. <laughs> something happened to that one. Get another one. Now, this is what the, what the basic APA, PAP is look like. You notice it needs to have two different things. Now, I did it so that I can show you what it does. Theoretically, this is put wrong. There's a picture taken by one of my customers, which I just noticed. This side should only face on the outside. And this edge to the outer edge of the car. All right? Why do we do that? You want the absolute consistency. That means you've got an outside, you want to expose of the carbon. You do not care whatever. You do not put it on the knot, you put the exposed part of your carbon, S to S, try to be centered. Now you notice on another company, my entire thing is slidable. Because not two persons shoot the same arrow all the time. So what you're looking for is the entire shaft resulting back. How come I always put in the center? Even is an arrow, even is an arrow concept system, because that's what the arrow is going to be. No matter what, the resulting band is always in the center. Yes, you can shift it somewhere off and left and right, but then you're no longer consistent. So you want to develop a consistent process for all your arrows, even you have arrow concept. Now, by doing so, we are now getting the resulting band of the shaft. Now, why is there a vibration module on the top? That was actually another one of those deals. I'm trying to develop the world's most sensitive 
automatic systems. The fact is that I don't think anybody want to pay $20,000 for the resulting of it. So I say, well, that's nothing better than a human finger, which is true, but a human finger needs help. I mean, just like when you drop a piece of oil on a piece of table and then slam it, the oil won't move. But when you tap the table, the oil moves. Am I right? So what's changed? I'm actually inserting energy into the shaft. That's the reason right up there is an old Motorola vibration module. Like you some zzz, zzz. I put one of those in those and put a brass on it. So what it does is that when you press the button, there's, there's energy going through the entire brass into the entire system. What it does is that you lower the initial friction. So when you roll the shaft, you can feel the difference. Now you know why anybody trained. You can now spine a dozen arrow in less than two minutes. A lot of people don't believe me. In uh, 2015 I, I, uh, IPO in Indiana, one gentleman come to me a dozen arrow that he spent two days spine tuning <laughs> shafts. He said, Dodge, I want to see how good your, your arrow is. So he gave me a say, I said, you want me to do it forward or backward? He said, what do you mean? I said, looking at it or backward doing it. He said, it doesn't matter. So I did a whole dozen arrow spine it. And I marked mine. After I finished, I give it back to him. Damn you! <laughs> I spent two days doing the same thing in two minutes. <laughs> and I do it in front of Black Eagle with Jason Wilkins and uh, Dan McCarthy. I do it backwards. And it's right on. <laughs> so they can't say I'm just making this up. <laughs> I also do that in 2000, uh, for Dan McCarthy, I did in 2016 IBO Indiana. So you can verify that. Now let's look at it. Why is this ball bearing so critical? And if, a lot of people build their own spine tester, so-called. But let's take a look at what spine tester really does. What, is this, what are you trying to do? A lot of people are looking for the high and low spot of the spine. We just learned that the high and low spot don't mean anything. Because the high and low spot only means the, in, uh, is the imperfection of the grinding process. What are you really looking for? It's the lowest possible bend point. Now, a lot of people put on it and they try to turn it. I say, okay, this is the highest point. You are just looking at the imperfection of the grinding process of the high. Now, you put weight on it, that's a different story. But when you put a weight on it, like a typical, what, how many contact points do you actually have when you do that? The typical machine nowadays have no less than one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four plus infinity. You got two hooks and you got four ball bearings. What are the ball bearings profile? They are flat. So the moment you bend, what part of the ball bearing is touching it? The edge of that ball bearing, right on the flat edge. So you are just increasing the friction way up scale and you are not using the curve. Now if you take a closer look at this ball bearing, you notice know crown? Second, you notice there's a screw here, right? Like everybody. No. That screw is the center part. So I'm no longer relying on a screw that go into the ball bearing and then screw there. The center post is the screw. So now you don't have binding issue. Because every time you got bobbing a screw in it, the bobbing turns, you got the binding issue. And but if you've got a crown ball bearing, the pressure is always tangent. So you always push down. Even at the angle, it's still pointing down because it's curved. Now you can get perfectly, when you, when you put the pressure on the shaft and you turn it, you can find exactly where the bend point is, the first dynamic bend point. Then I say, how do you know the force is indeed linear? If you look at the arrow APS system, see this three part right here? What are those? Those are not pushing. Those are linear barriers. That means you got three points on a linear bearing. What's going to happen with the vertical travel? <coughs> it's within half thousands, no matter which way you sway. Now with that, that means I can feel which way is coming in. So all of a sudden, I got six points because I got six crown bearing touching it, pushing down. That is the best you can possibly do mechanically. And finally, this is what most company, most arrow company bought for me. Is that when, when you get a dozen, say dozen arrow, you say 350 or 
the study. Supposedly the sky. <laughs> what does 350 really mean? 350,000 drop based on a 2018 support at 1.94 pound. 1.92 pound. By the way, you know why it's 1.92 pound? Somebody screwed up. It's supposed to be two pound. <laughs> it was a mistake, but become the standard. <laughs> so how do you know that? So I actually built this digital module. I actually entered the entire system, but unlike others, I got a zero, zero reference. Because you use any single machine, when you put a weight on it, weight is zero. If you don't have a zero, just like I want to make sure to take this table with a 10 foot ruler, where is my zero? You need a starting point. At this current moment, every single spy machine do not have zero in it. Isn't that funny? Hmm. <laughs> that means they always start with something. But what is that something? They don't know. Always within five to ten thousands. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, great. So we have 350, do I have 340 or 360? Okay. Now, next thing you ask yourself this question. Now, we want to learn the error of the spine. Okay. This one, two, three, four points. When we say 350, what, what is that? Is it at this point, this point, this point, this point, or this point at 350? The answer is that it's supposed to be the average. So if you every, actually measure arrow, you find a low point of arrow, which is this point. Then you do a check to get your first number. Then you get a second low point. You do a shake. Then you rotate it 45, 90 degree, do a register. Then rotate 180 degree, do a register. After you add the four number together, divide it by four. That is the true spine of the shaft. If you somebody tell you you can use one measurement and get the true spine of the shaft, he's lying. Because the moment put 1.92 pounds, you know the arrow is going to go to the lower spine, higher spine, side spine, and opposite spine. That's going to be at least minimum on a 350 spine, 25,000 difference. So I say, no, 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 this error is not 350, it's, three, it's 375, it's too low. I say, did you measure it, rotate 180 degree and see what happened? I say, well, it's 180 degree right. Answer is no, 180 degree is not right. Because as we already mentioned, carbon shafts are not linear spine. 180 degree, you are actually pointing at this point. That's not the lowest. It's not the second lowest. It's not the highest. You don't know what you got. Now we go into a little bit further. What happened? The arrow is not straight. Maybe we'll ask a question. What does 1,000 straightness arrow mean? Anybody know? You say, well, this arrow is 1,000 straightness. What does that mean? No variance from one all the way down through the. You don't get a deviation. You hope. Yeah, none of the above. This is what it means. Support. Support. At 28 inches. With a laser. Pointing down. To 360 degree. It shows 1000. The arrow is 1000 thickness. So what happens if the arrow who looks like this? This arrow is 1000 thickness. <laughs> Isn't it? Mm -hmm. It met the requirement. <laughs> but <laughs> let's look at this. Or if you cut it. <laughs> no, because it's 20 right. inches. So, oh, if you, yeah, yeah. yeah, if the arrow is like this, yep, yep, yep. you cut it right here. Hmm. Isn't that funny? That is what the industry is selling you. <laughs> you go through a laser at 20 inches. If what happens if the arrow is like this? This arrow is 1,000 fingers. Hmm. As a matter of fact, you notice those. Because yeah. the best thing you can do is get your arrow put on the table and roll it. That will find those. <laughs> yeah. And can you do something about it? Answer is absolutely. Don't shoot those. And the moment when you use my PAPS system with a digital gauge, now this is actually less, this is more for manufacturer, for like myself. Today's, all the machines are pretty good. When they tell you a 350, they are pretty damn good on it. 
I mean, the old days, we, we shot a name. Some company are 30,000. I mean, that's reason on a sister company, when they say three, oh, I should this so much better than the other one. Yeah, because the, their 350 is actually a 330. <laughs> and you should better with a 330. Their sister company is supposed to say machine. No, they're not. As a matter of fact, a lot of times when you put a the finishing process can actually change the spine of the arrow. While I this, I will, I will, I will give you a tip. Do you know what is, if you hunt in rain or weather all the time, what is the worst kind of arrow you can shoot? You hunt in heavy rain, late winter snowing, what is the worst arrow you can shoot? Carbon. Really? No, it's not. Nothing to do with the, with the, arrow, with the material of the arrow. What is that? What? Any ca arrow have camo on it. Really? Why? What's the big deal? <coughs> the camo process is a, is a, is a paper-based print process. The moment when you rain on it, that paper holds the water on it. So all of a sudden, your 31-inch arrow can add as much as 50 grains off-center weight. Great. <laughs> wow. Went a little low. <laughs> and not to mention the arrow start flying sideways. That's the reason when you're hunt, you hunting with rainy days, you know some of the arrow don't fly through. How do you circumvent it? I'll share a tip with you. I learned it from a very good customer of mine. If you want to get yourself a good set of carbon arrow and turtle wax ice paste it, and then leave it out for a week, post water will shed right off. <laughs> You have no such water effect. Rain X. <laughs> yes, sir, you got it. Isn't that funny? <laughs> yeah, most people never believed it. Well, you know what 50 greens do when we're shooting setting up arrows. And a lot of people say, oh, I, first of all, why would you need camel arrows? You never find them. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> the camel process was originally done by Gotip. It's a paper, it's a paper water transfer, no, it's a paper tapes process. Carbon Express copied it. And no. they find, they tried to patent it, but couldn't because Goldtip started it. Well, that pretty much concluded the entire arrow process.